Hi, hi everyone. So uh, I'm Colin Amé. Um, I'm not going to speak a lot about myself because I'm pretty much the only Amé in the country, so you can stalk me on LinkedIn or Twitter or wherever. Um, there are some other Amés, but we all live in the same house. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about bugs, what they are, where they come from, and some ways that we can have of stopping them. Um, so um, let's start with what is a bug? Um, let's go straight to the dictionary because um, different people have different ideas of what a bug is. So Oxford Dictionary, error in a computer program or system, or Cambridge mistake or problem in a computer program. So they're both focusing on there being something wrong. Um, I like the Oxford Dictionary, it has system as well. Um, but um, let's uh, go and look at another definition. So um, let's try dictionary.com. A generic term that describes a malfunction of undetermined origin in a computer or other electronic device, which is great because it's expanded out from just being the computer into other devices as well. Um, but the undetermined origin is a bit of a problem. So uh, if we determine its origin, does it stop being a bug? <laughs> it's still there. Um, so one of the problems with, it, with the use of the term bug, or you, know, you use defect or um, other terms, is that we use it to mean different things. So um, there's three main things that we use it to describe. So you've detected a problem. That's a bug. Well, actually, it's what you've, your description of what you've seen. <coughs> um, to use a medical analogy, you've detected a symptom. You found the symptom and you've, you know what it is. So you write down what the symptom is. You write a bug report that people also call that. There's, there's, there's a bug. There's a defect in the, in, in the ticking, ticketing system. Um, but that's, that's just a report of the symptom. It doesn't necessarily fully describe the symptom or how it, it came about, what the underlying problem is. So the underlying problem itself, that's the bug. Now, to continue the medical analogy, it's the disease that you are having a problem with. So um, my um, definition of a, of a bug is that it's, um, it's behavior that is undesirable, undesirable to the user, undesirable to the business, um, that is <coughs> happening within some kind of software system. Um, so running along with the medical analogy, we want to be able to, to, to detect the bug, so see the symptom, create a fix or a cure, and then we want to set up systems of prevention or vaccination against our bugs. <coughs> Why did that turn off? Stop it. Um, I apologize for the, for the paper, but I have so many speaker notes that the scroll just doesn't help. Um, okay, so we've got to have a quadrant diagram in an agile talk, so um, here's one. So we've got on the right, specified behavior. On the left, unspecified behavior, because we all know we've got projects where some of the behavior gets specified, and some of it no one tells you about. It's kind of assumed. Um, and correct behavior at the top, incorrect behavior at the bottom. So top left quadrant, you've got software working as expected. OK? Um, so bottom left quadrant, um, bottom right, sorry, facing, there's a bug, um, is uh, actual wrong stuff, erroneous behavior. Two plus two shouldn't equal five. Yeah? Um, an error in the code has resulted in the wrong answer or the wrong thing has happened. You know, you've committed the wrong thing to the database, whatever. Um, the next quadrant, so at that top left, um, technically correct behavior, but it's not been specified. Um, we're a bit bit more into the woolly realms of what a bug is over here because um, 
it might, it's not necessarily wrong, but it's not what you expect. So um, if you're, for instance, in a ticket buying flow, you're buying tickets for a conference, uh, and um, they're allocated seating, so you select your seats, you go through the payment flow, and your credit card's declined or whatever. So you go back, and for some reason, you have to start the ordering flow right at the beginning, and you go in and select your seats, and the seats that you selected before, they're already selected and they're not available anymore to you. You've got to select some different seats. Now, that's not necessarily wrong. Those seats have been reserved for your previous flow, but it's not what you expected. So it's unexpected behavior. And then the, uh, the last quadrant is it's unspecified and wrong behavior. Um, so uh, um, side effects kind of fall into that category. So um, you've added a new and really popular feature to your website and loads of people are using it and it exhausts database handles in the back end and it causes other features of the project, of the project to be slow or even unusable. And that sort of emergent behavior. Um, all this stuff on, on this side of the diagram is really common in neural networks, where they like to call it emergent behavior. Um, some of it's good, some of it's bad. So um, great examples. Um, lots of people have heard about Microsoft's um, Twitter chat bot called Tay. Um, they put it online to learn <coughs> off people's interactions. And surprise, surprise, it became a racist Nazi in less than a day. Um, so less well-known um, examples are um, some researchers did a um, walking robot. And they taught it how to work, walk with the neural network. And then they started turning off its legs. So its legs were basically broken and um, continued letting it learn. And they thought, well, we've turned off, turned off one leg, two legs, still, still working, three legs, still got one leg left, it's still managing to move along, four legs. Oh, it's still moving. What's going on? It had learned to flip itself over and walk on its knees. <laughs> um, so um, weird emergent behavior. And I think that um, the stories of Crapageggett Crapageddon from vacuum robots um, encountering pet messes are oh. um, bugs in that emergent area. All right, so um, where do bugs come from? Um, I want to classify our, you know, we've got bugs, they're a disease. I want to classify the disease. Why do I want to do that? Why do doctors learn about symptoms? You know, they learn about symptoms and the related <coughs> diseases so they can diagnose them more easily. I want to do the same with bugs. If you can come away from this talk with a bit more information about where bugs come from that enables you to um, be quicker at diagnosing a live problem, um, be better at coding stuff that defends against those bu bugs, or create better test cases, then I've succeeded. Um, so we want diagnosis, we want a cure, we want prevention. So let's know our enemy. Where do, where do we get bugs from? So, Bug in the code. Great. Everyone knows what a bug in the code looks like. Um, there's innumerable um, examples of this. So everyone's seen a typo in code causing a bug. Everyone's seen a logical error. You know, you've got an inversion of the logic in a, in a conditional statement. It's fairly straightforward. Um, a conditional block is meant to return. There's a missing return statement, so it carries on afterwards. That's a Good, good example, um, or code paths where a um, variable is meant to have been set and you, there's a certain code path you get through and the variable's not been in initialized. Another opportunity for a bug. Um, more nuanced in code, I've not got code examples because it'd take forever. I'm at, only got half now. Um, language problems. Um, most people know about um, numerical precision of most languages. Um, there are very few languages in which 0.1 plus 0.2 actually equals exactly 0.3. You 
In most languages, you'll find it's 0 0.300004. Um, stack overflows are a language problem. Buffer overflows. Um, and an interesting one for a language problem. Um, back in 1962, an um, algorithm for binary search. Does everyone know what binary search is? Yeah? So big array, it's a sorted array, you're searching for a value in it. Um, so the original algorithm was about 1962. In Programming Pearls in 1986, they um, published a Java implementation of this. In 2006, someone who was using a massive array for their binary search finally noticed that was, there, was, there was a numerical overflow. So when you are searching the top half of the array, the indexes are the top and halfway down, numerically overflowed the index and caused a bug. So it's a numerical overflow bug. It took 44 years for someone to notice. <laughs> Okay, um, moving on. Um, dangerous code practice. Now, execution of code in your data. So you're evaling something. It's a great opportunity for bugs there. Um, or zombie code. You've written some debug code. You left some debug code in place. Or you um, created um, created something using automated code snippets from your IDE. No, it's not code that you specifically intend to be executed, but sometimes as a zombie, it wakes up and eats your brains. Um, copy and paste. It's a really good opportunity for some bugs, but helpful IDE suggestions and automated code snippets all sort of contribute to that kind of uh, repetitive code that it's easy to um, overlook bugs in. Uh, you've got unhandled exceptions. Class names that are conflicting. Um, I've been working a lot in Java lately and um, I had a project that used um, Java's own futures, which are called future, Java util future, and it also used the Vava library, which is Java upside down, um, which implemented its own version of futures. So in different places in the code, it had a Vava future or a normal future. Which one's been used? Um, special case code. Um, if you've got some code that's only executing for certain users or is for a very rare circumstance, um, that can hide something for a very long time. Um, you might have written some code specifically to deal with a hardware problem with a specific set of hardware, and you know, you, you've written an Android app. Um, you're dealing with a Samsung, Samsung funny. Um, that can hide your code. Um, another source for code problems is um, conflict resolution. You're doing merge conflict, you let Git automatically um, deal with that merge conflict. Sometimes the way it deals with the merge conflict will cause a bug, just in the way, in the order it's put the lines together. Um, but you, you might have dealt with the, the merge manually and mucked it up. Um, last one under code is you fixed one bug and that <coughs> enabled more code paths that's actually revealed another bug that you could, didn't see there before. That's covered code. Where else do the bugs come from? You've got dependencies, you know, external dependencies. Um, so you can exceed your limits on your dependencies, throughput limits. Um, actual hard stop licenses on certain things. I know. Um, there's a um, big concern at the moment where I'm working about um, blowing out our license with Salesforce um, because apparently when you hit your license with Salesforce, your API calls just get rejected. Um, and um, 
And of course, over the network, you've got edge case behavior, dropped packets, um, and other misroutings of, of your um, <coughs> connection. You might have inconsistencies in your database. You might have error modes in the dependency that you, maybe you can see, maybe you can't see them. Um, dependency upgrades can change behavior. Um, one that hit us quite hard once was um, we did a MySQL upgrade and it changed one of the defaults, which we were dependent on, the one, on that default value, but we hadn't set it explicitly in config because it was a default. But we'd up upgraded MySQL, it changed the default, changed the behavior. Um, you could have incompatibilities between your components. Um, not just because they're incompatible, but because the code that's been written has been written against poor or wrong API documents. Um, or it's just that the, the implementation has deviated from the API documents. You know, the document says an ID is unique and the implementation didn't make it unique. Um, there might be a bug in the dependency. If it's open source, you might get a fix. Um, it's closed source. Hopefully you've got a support contract with them. Um, and the one which will strike a, a common note with a lot of people is being required to use a dependency which poorly fits for the use case. Um, you know, your IT director has gone out for lunch with someone and bought a piece of software that you must use now for this project because of um, they've got a kickback for it or they've just um, sunk enough emotional into it that they're um, falling for the sunk cost fallacy and are, in, are uh, insisting that you use it. But there are some other pl places where you might get bugs. You might get bugs from your data. Your data might get corrupt or just be dirty. You might in assume there's integrity constraints but they don't apply, they've been broken. Um, you might be dependent on random numbers and have failed to seed your random number generator. Or it's been seeded with a predictable value. There's a lot of uh, security bugs that are reliant on um, random number generators that are seeded with um, predictable values. You've also got caching, falls under here. Don't assume you don't have caching. If you're calling something over the network, and that data is cacheable, you might be calling through a CDN or an, on some kind of edge network that has cached it. And caches can be poisoned, bad data stored. Another area, environment. No? Local environment, fine, works on my machine. Put it in the test environment. Oh, suddenly I've got problems with software configuration. I've got problems where um, I've got a hardware fault in the test environment that I don't have locally. And you've got the um, famous Pentium floating point division error from years ago. Um, more recently, Meltdown and Spectre, they're both hardware faults. Um, you might find that you've got, um, in production, you're adding headers from your CDN or your proxy that are not present in um, in your test environment. So you've got CSP headers that are banning the browser from loading certain things. Um, load can cause race conditions that you've, you know, in, in production, you've got enough load there, you've got a race condition that occurs. Um, you might have deployment issues. You might have a split brain deployment. So it might be deliberate. You might have blue green um, deployment and the version differential between blue and green are interacting poorly together. Um, you might have done it by accident. You might have done a deployment, it's failed halfway through. So you've got half your hosts on one version, half your hosts on the previous version. Um, you could deploy code that wasn't the code that you tested just because your deployment pipelines aren't set up right. They're always pulling master and you tested the previous version. Someone's added something since you tested. Um, 
You might have breaking changes that are to do with deployment. So you've got a database migration that has to occur as part of deployment and you've, because you've got two different versions or, or um, timing issues, that's causing you problems. Your rollback might cause you a problem. Um, if you're using NoSQL and you've got documents, that's, you know, you've changed the structure of them. Now you've got to write code that deals with the structure in the old way and the new way, otherwise you're going to have problems at deployment time. And similar, you've got sessions. You know? You've got a user who's in the middle of their session, you do a deployment, and you've changed the shape of the session. How does their browser then behave? Does it blow up? Give a 500. Um, a particularly nasty one in some environments <coughs> is adding third-party tracker code. You know, you've put some third-party tracker code on, on the front end to, to do ad serving and all kinds of stuff. Often those bring in other third-party dependencies. Sometimes it's non-deterministic. They're bringing in dependencies that you haven't seen and your users do. Um, might be caused by the load profile. You, know, you might have spiky load in your, uh, in your production environment that you don't have in, in the test environment. You might find that through bad load balancing <coughs> or through split demand that your load profile isn't flat across your infrastructure. In, uh, a typical one is a Redis cache. It uses keys to split how your, um, how your storage is used. So if, you're, uh, if you've got one particular key in your Redis cache that is used a lot, then that host will get hotter than the other host. Um, you might have uh, a database where you've split the reads and writes and the writer is hotter than the reader or vice versa, um, which you might not have split those in a different environment. Okay, so um, whizzing through the last few. So bugs in the interface. Um, so this is more about people using your system so people might use unusual inputs. They might have funny characters in their names. They might be deliberately trying to break things. You know, people sending each other, uh, I know you've got an iPhone. I'm gonna send you the, the funny SMS that causes your iPhone to reboot when you receive it. That happened, that happened in 2015. It also happened in 2018. They had a recurrence of that problem. Um, the client might be bad. I had a... Um, might be doing bad behavior. I had a um, occurrence. I was running a, a retail website and um, there was someone off on the internet. They were scraping <coughs> the site for all the products. Um, but they'd, they'd written their scraping, scraping code themselves and they were failing to close the TCP connection. So they were gradually consuming all the connections on my Apache children. And the website got slower and slower and suddenly stopped. And we restarted Apache and it was fine. And so your clients can be bad. Um, or they can be just bad actors. I mean, cross-site scripting, all those kind of security flaws from the, from the front end fall into this area. Um, last area. Bugs in the design. No. Um, this is painful. Um, you might have inconsistent requirements. You've got competing requirements. Um, the design decisions that you made when you wrote code, you might have made assumptions. You might have made the wrong assumptions. Um, protocol problems. There was a problem last year with the WPA2 wireless protocol. It's a security problem. It's got, and they've got a fun name, crack. Um, there's a problem with the protocol, not a problem with the implementation or anything like that. Um, some GPG implementations um, in combination with email had a protocol problem, which led to uh, a thing they called e-fail. Um, you might have a, a flaw in the infrastructure that you've designed might have a single point of failure that's not particularly obvious. Um, your, your designed infrastructure might lead to a cascade failure. 
you, one, one node fails and the rest of them start toppling over. Um, you might be trying to use the system outside of its original design parameters, which might include confused users doing things in the wrong order or pressing the wrong button or pressing things too quickly. I'll just skip that page, click, click, click. Oh, I've submitted it three times. Um, sometimes you get a piece of behavior that is accidentally key to another part of your system. And it's old behavior and someone says, right, we're gonna take, take that away now. And so it gets retired and take, taken out. And suddenly everything breaks because you've had this key dependency that wasn't realized, but it's been removed. Okay, that's a whistle stop very quickly through many different areas of bugs. So how do we combat the menace of bugs? Um, so turn off your improbability drive first. Um, and then um, we all know about the test pyramid. Let's squash a bug. Um, we've got all our logical driven development, TDD, BDD, all our test automation. Um, it can help with some of our categories of bugs, typically typos, cop um, copy paste errors, logical bugs, all those co sort of code focused bugs really um, helped with our automation testing. Um, but you have to be aware about copy and pasting between your implementation and your test code. Now, if you copy and paste too much or you duplicate too much between them, then you know, is your test code really good about, at finding the same problems of the code that you're um, testing? It's not proof against the problems of design and interface and environment or requirement inconsistencies. Um, and of course, you can have bugs in your automation code. You can kind of defend against that a bit with techniques like mutation testing. Um, and you might be driven by false confidence. If you've got 100% coverage, that might be, uh, give you too much um, confidence in it. Uh, so combine the, that test pyramid with defensive coding. Use what I've talked about today to expect every possible thing to go wrong. If you write test cases for everything that goes wrong, you cover some of the interface and environment and dependency issues that you might have. You might think that you're accessing REST service. It has a JSON response. Okay. In practice, you might get a HTML response because you're making a HTTP call and it's giving you an a, um, error from the CDN. You're not actually getting to the API, you're getting XML back. So code defensively. Really important, exploratory testing. You've, you with many of you are testers. No. Me as a dev, no. automation doesn't cut it. I want testers who are gonna go out and challenge the assumptions that I've made about the code. I want them to go and explore the user expectations through modeling. I want them to use common bad strings. I want them to go out and use white hat and black hat hacker techniques to try and break the code, deliberately trying to break it. No, that's more like, no, if you've got a physical product, you've got an iPhone, you know, you go in the test labs for an iPhone. They are taking an iPhone and they're smashing weights into the screen over and over until it breaks. They're doing destruction testing, testing them to the limits. Um, that's what I see as exploratory testing. I want to see you break, break what I've written. Right. It's done ten, ten ton weight. Um, so moves on to non-functional testing. <coughs> Test under lots of different conditions. Get load on it. Do some chaos engineering. Expose those bugs. And of course, get some production monitoring. Get new relic in, get app dynamics in, get sent. I don't care what it is. Get monitoring your production system. Get rid of the noise, because you'll find the moment you turn monitoring on, you go, 5% of our web requests have got a JavaScript error on them. We had that at Skybet and spent quite a while going, right, let's fix that one and got it down to 
practically none, so that when there was a big problem spike, we could see it, got out the signal to noise ratio. So I've looked at what bugs are, where they come from, and some of what we can do about them. Um, it's been a bit of a speedy tour. Um, it's clear that we need to face facts that we're never going to have a world without bugs. There's always going to be some bug somewhere. Um, it doesn't exculpate our responsibility to try and get rid of them. And we need to attack them from lots of different angles, not just automation, get manual testing, non-functionals, everything else. Just automation isn't enough. And that's me, Finn. <laughs>